Well, hello and welcome. My name is Anna Diaz, and I'm a principal and lead advisor with Dallin and Yonke Wealth Advisors. And on behalf of my teammates, all our colleagues at Dallin and Yonke, we're so glad you joined us for today's conversation. So we are also excited because we are in our 30th year anniversary. When Dale Yonke and our co-founders founded our firm 30 years ago, they were pioneers as an independent wealth advisor and as a fiduciary. Today, we provide investment management and financial planning services for over 1,300 clients, and that's individuals, families, and organizations, and today managing over $5 billion in assets. We're also excited because this is a really interesting conversation, and as our team chats, we love hearing what's going on in the lives of our clients, and many of you were asking questions about returning to travel. We were excited to partner with Dr. Chris Sidford of Black Bag Global Emergency Medicine to talk about travel safety. So looking forward to today's uh, conversation. Let me tell you a little bit about Dr. Sidford. So he's a board certified physician in emergency, emergency medicine with over 30 years of health and private medicine experience. He practiced and cared for over 100 for clients in over 150 countries and locations to date, ranging from the mountains of Patagonia to ships in the Labrador Sea. As a U.S. Naval officer, Dr. Sidford served as a faculty member of the Emergency Medicine Residency Training Program and provided emergency medical support for NATO troops during amphibious operations in the Arctic Circle. So providing care in difficult and remote locations became the impetus for Black Bag. It's also exciting to share that very recently, Black Bag was awarded the Healthcare Firm Award by Family Wealth Reports. And actually this is the third year in a row that they've won this award. So before I turn it over to Dr. Sidford, just a couple housekeeping items. So first of all, thank you. Many of you submitted questions when you registered for today's webinar. We did share those with Dr. Sidford and so he'll be incorporating a lot of that into his talk today. However, I'll also be incorporating a Q&A session after he speaks. So we hope to answer additional questions. There is a Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Feel free to send questions as they come up and we'll do our best to cover as much as we can today. Again, we're so glad you're here. And with that, Dr. Sidford, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Anna, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to see you again and uh, congratulations to you and your team. I know you had some great news recently in your, uh, your neck of the woods. So uh, thank you very much. And uh, I'm gonna share the screen now and get us started. So um, again, thank you very much for that introduction and thank you everybody for joining us. Um, I'm gonna try and share some of the lessons that we've learned as our organization looks after international travelers and security teams and so on. And, and as we all know, it's been a, a very challenging year and there's been a lot of um, really good news and some really bad news and, and really tough times to get decent information. So I'm gonna try and share what we've learned in the past year and, uh, and thank you again for those of you who have submitted questions and we'll get to some of those in the end. So just as Anna said, I, I did do a, some, an emergency medicine training program in Boston, uh, one of the original knife and gun club training programs. And I paid back a Navy scholarship in actually San Diego, San Francisco, uh, helped open up an underground nuclear chemical and biological proof hospital in the island of Sicily. And as part of the strange trips, I also got sent to the Arctic Circle to look after NATO troops. And this is some of the photographs that got me started in this line of work. So this is heading up after a 17 hour flight to begin to train for the various troops and so on. And this is pictures of various NATO uh, leaders and commanders and all the King's horses and all the King's men. And this is day one kicking off the amphibious landing. And this probably got me in the first opening of no matter what you plan for, you're going to see things you don't expect. So here we are on our first amphibious day. And two things happened we did not expect. The first is those people down by the beach with the red jackets and so on. That's Greenpeace that decided they'd come all the way up to the Arctic Circle and, and uh, streak through the landing, which I got to say I was not expecting. And the second bigger issue was that those half tracks coming up the beach cut through all our communication lines. So we were sort of essentially flying blind. And again, it was a sort of eye-opening experience is no matter how well you're trained, things happen. And so you try and train to be prepared for the unknown. And that's how it got started us, one in ER and then also in, in Black Bay. 
So I'm gonna try and summarize what we've learned and, and I'm, I'm gonna try and present the various aspects depending upon some as if you've never heard this discussion and some of it is if you're vaccinated and some if you're not and how we go forward from here. So the Clint Eastwood movie, obviously the good, bad and the ugly. Um, the good news is that the vaccines are incredibly effective um, and half of our, uh, the US population has gotten a single dose and almost close to 40% has gotten the second dose. Um, the bad news is that for whatever reason, misinformation, fear, doubt, whatever, about a third of the people don't plan to get one. And that's gonna be a really challenging part of moving forward to get, get beyond a, a pandemic existence for all of us. And some of the things that contribute to that are things like the, the various variants around the world. The one that's gotten the most attention and, and probably the, one of the countries in the worst shape is India because of their variant. And the variants happen because as the virus transmits from various people and cells and so on, it goes through genetic uh, variations. And so the variants develop that are in some way, they learn or develop newer ways to attach our cells or make us sicker and so on. And then these become more prevalent. So this, you've probably heard of the one that was in Britain, the B117, and then the one that was in South, South Africa and so on. So these variants are what is keeping us on our toes and trying to keep us as safe as we can while we get ready for, while we proceed. Just a heads up that places like the New York Times, I'm assuming the LA Times probably does it too, but you can log on with your email and create your own window for the various places you wanna track. So this is San Diego and I just logged on and picked this as one of the cities. It'll give you updates every day for cases, new cases, um, and changes and so on, and gives you some idea of where you are, um, depending upon in the country that you live. This is one of the original pictures from a small diner in China at the very beginning of the, of the epidemic. And it brings home one of the points I want uh, people to try and uh, remember is that this virus, as we all know, is incredibly sneaky. This is one person, the A1 circled in the yellow in the middle, who over the course of a short meal, ended up infecting half the people in this restaurant from one person. Nobody had symptoms. The original person infected had no symptoms. This ability is still there. It is greatly changed by the fact that many of us have already been vaccinated, but this is what's still out there. It's this unbelievable ability to infect and be contagious for people who don't know it. One of the questions we get a lot is, what do we do indoor, outdoor dining? And I'll try again to break this down into vaccinated or unvaccinated. If you who were unvaccinated for whatever reason, whether you were, there's a contraindication or whether you decide you don't want to do it or you're too young to get one yet. Uh, indoor dining, in my view, is, is a no-no. There's just no way for you to take a mask off inside with other people. It's just too, too likely for you to get sick and, and get quite sick from it. Some of the attempts at the, at the tent dining and so on, unless you're in with the very same people in your bubble, those are still all ri very risky events. And I would even go so far as to say, for those of you who are vaccinated, um, if you're vaccinated and you're living with only vaccinated people and you wanna go in a group of vaccinated people to a small restaurant, I think that's still a good idea indoors. If you are going to a large setting, if you have any kind of underlying conditions, if you wanna be safe and cautious, it's not time to go indoor yet because it's still, we still do not know what the variance and what vaccination does in terms of protection. And I'll come back to that a little bit in a minute. Some of the super spread events from the fall and, and now even still, there's still some events that are, are pretty serious because kids have not been vaccinated yet because they're still testing which ones are safe for children. Sporting events were big spreader events, particularly in New England where hockey is king. Um, so they had to shut down a lot of the, of the, of the tournaments and so on because too many kids were coming home sick. Uh, a lot of indoor singing events or speaking events are where people can um, push their voice out and, their, and their, their song, but unfortunately that carries with it also virus and that's how they get spread. And probably the number one risk right now is that people who go to work when they're sick, um, for those of you who've been to whatever type of, of screening at a door, when someone does a little thermometer, a digital thermometer on your forehead, those are really inaccurate. And by the time they screen and catch that fever, it's probably too late. Way more people are getting through that screening. So you really have to be diligent if you run a business or a part of business or have coworkers is that if they do not feel well for any reason, 
they need to stay home until they can confirm that they do or don't have COVID. This is just, uh, I thought, a, an interesting case from a large church, one piano player, um, and those over two days of playing, this person was an asymptomatic carrier. And those are the number of people who got sick from this one person. And the green numbers are people who were 30 meters, so somewhere between 40 and 50, and maybe as far as 70 feet away, got infected from this one person. So again, if you're unvaccinated and unmasked, the risks are really quite serious. Some clues that you may have heard of or may not have heard of, I think we've all heard of losing taste or smell, which is really awful, but there's also something called paranosmia where you get, when your smell starts to come back, not only do you get a, a, a smell, but you get a bad smell for good things. So some of your favorite foods may smell like rotten eggs. And these are some clues to having had or, or progressing through COVID. And the symptoms that people get Again, you probably all have had somebody who's had it or have known of it, and there's the typical fever, aches, maybe a cough, short of breath, but things like a headache, isolated headache, or sore throat, diarrhea, and so on, those are still signs of COVID. And for people who have young children or grandchildren, these are things that, again, these are triggers to get COVID tested to make sure that that's not why they have those symptoms. You may have also all heard of long COVID, and that's the unfortunate outcome for people who have recovered from COVID that may have I think there's up to 70 symptoms they can have from fatigue to sort of foggy brain to ring in the ears. And these can go on for months in about one in seven people who recover from COVID. So this is more sort of a reminder of why we want to be diligent about either being careful or getting vaccinated. I'm a big proponent of certain types of masks. And for those of you who are unvaccinated, you all know that you still have to wear them anytime you're within a certain distance of people. But even for people who are vaccinated with no underlying conditions, places like healthcare settings, any kind of public transportation, if you're gonna go on a flight, if you're gonna get on a train, um, if you're gonna go visit uh, relatives in a uh, nursing facility or so on, um, a mask is essential. And the, the, the masks that I recommend, they were difficult to get, but now they're much easier to get, are called N95s. And they're medical grade, 3M makes a great one, I'll show you in the next slide. But the difference is not only does it filter out 95% of particles, but because the N95s have an electrostatic layer, it actually has a magnetized attraction to the small viral particles, so it's even more effective. There's a couple of um, things you should know. There's there's certain brands that have graphene in it, which was thought to be antibacterial. The trouble with the antibacterial is that actually that material broke off, so people were inhaling it. So be careful what kind of mass you get. The gentleman on the right has a couple problems with that kind of mask. That's a contractor's N95 mask. So the mask itself filters very nicely when he breathes in. The problem is he's got that port, that box in the middle, which is actually an exhalation port. So when he breathes out, it goes straight out and there's no filtration. So the mask works great for him. It does not work great for you if you're next to him on an airplane or if you're standing next to him in line at a grocery store. And the other issue for those of you that, are, that are, um, have beards is you're breaking what was hoped to be a nice seal against your face. So you're making that mask much less efficient and the chances of you breathing in particles is much higher. This is great if you're doing you know, compound work or, or spackling or something in the house, but it's not very good in terms of preventing the COVID. Consumerlab.com down the left is one of my favorite sites. It's a small yearly fee and it goes over all sorts of natural supplements, but has really nice reviews on the various masks that you can get. And my two, my one favorite is the, called the um, the 3M. It's the it's the mask to the top left, and it's a fold down 3M, very comfortable N95 mask. Whenever you buy any of these masks, N95s, even a KN95, you want to look for the NIOSH. That, that uh, name up the top left is the National Institute of Occupational Safety and Health. It means that they verified that that mask is what it says it is, and can and at least tell you you know what you're buying. It was very difficult to find them, but now you can go to two sites that carry them. Um, Clinical Supplies USA carries the 3M, and then GDI Medical on the right is another very nice NIOSH N95. They're both very comfortable and very reliable. And I think that we're going to be with this COVID idea and so on for several months, if not years. So the idea that you're traveling without a mask is probably pretty far off, even if you're vaccinated. So I would suggest that you uh, stockpile, put a box of these in your closet or two, 
and keep them around for when you have to travel, even if you've been vaccinated. The LA linen uh, mask down below, the cloth masks that have one or two or three layers um, can be very effective. They're almost as good as the N95s. And this is one of the highest rated ones is the LA linen. It's supposed to be very comfortable and very effective. I would still go with the 3M if you can get it, but these are, these are all good choices. If you have them and you need to use them on a regular basis, maybe you have healthcare, healthcare workers in your family or yourself or you're volunteering, you can actually wash these. You can either leave them in a, in a standing by themselves for five days, at which time the, the virus will have died off if you were exposed, but you can also recycle them in a um, rice cooker. The, the recipes are all over the internet, but it's basically either with moisture or without. If you put water at the bottom, you put a towel down and then put those in and you heat it at 120 degrees for about 20 minutes. So you can reuse these masks over and over again. And I know the CDC came out recently and said, well, you know, the masks, you don't need to wear them and we're more comfortable. I agree that that's probably where we're going to get to. I think that was a little premature because we really don't know who's been vaccinated and who's not. And there's such a um, cantankerous discussion about who can or can't get vaccinated. I think it was a little early to do that. Um, there are a couple of the, the products down below where they're touting a ultraviolet C lighting that you can use as a wand or a box to clean off supplies. Yes, those do work as a wand. It doesn't really work very well unless the surface is, is sort of a smooth, dry surface. So if you're going to bring in, I've seen people on a plane who bring this and try and scan their canvas seat, it doesn't work. Um, and so really those are not that effective. It's still, you can use a Clorox wipe. Um, if you want to put your keys on your phone in the box on the left, that's useful. Then you got to rotate them. But a bit, most of that is a bit of hype. For, for people who are looking for, I've had a number of attorneys. I have uh, security teams that are covering embassies where they can't control who comes in and out and whether they're mass or vaccinated. There are a number of systems that can help you clean the air you're in. And Synergist is a dry hydrogen peroxide system. It's the only system that I'm aware of that's effective at decreasing virus in the air while people are in the room. There are all sorts of systems that you can turn on when you leave the office. Let's say you're an attorney and you need to do closings or you have to have clients that come in and you're concerned about your health or somebody's elderly or immunosuppressed. Um, these are now in a variety of gyms, grocery stores, hotels, and so on. The model at the left is the smallest one. It's about $1,200, but it's a really nice option for a degree of comfort or peace of mind for you running a business or even some clients who have a number of workers in their house and so on that are nervous about it. We, we install, we have them install these. If you're gonna travel, um, eye protection has been proven to be a benefit and there are different options you can use. You can put this, the mask uh, over your face, the face guard. Uh, I'm not a big fan of those because they're just so cumbersome, but there are a number of people that you've flown that, that will fly with those. Um, you cannot use that in lieu of the mask. You have to use both. But I'm a big fan of the onion goggles on the left. Those are available on Amazon for about, I think it's 15 or $18. It's foam fitting. It's meant to be used, honestly, when you're cutting onions. But they're very comfortable, and it's a nice sort of protection from your eyes, particularly if you're on a, an airplane or public transportation or even healthcare setting. A couple of risk factors people might want to know about is e-cigarettes are, are, in my mind, are, are inviting trouble anyway, but it does multiply your risk of getting COVID or the complications by a factor of five. Um, the other thing which you may want to tell to your um, either children, yourselves or young males is that COVID does increase erectile dysfunction about six times more likely in young patients, which is always obviously gets their attention. So whatever means you can to have them be careful. Um, this is one of the sort of discussions to have. Social distancing, which we've carried around for a number of months is six feet was meant to be the prevention. And, and I wanted to explain that it's really not a prevention, it's a control. Six feet is not the safety where you can't get it. It means as a population, as students, as classrooms and so on, it's meant to slow down the spread. It is not stop it. So a number of people who I've had discussion with over the last year who said, well, we're, we're indoors, we're six feet away, what can be the problem? It doesn't work that way. It's meant to slow it down. And I'll never forget, there was a, a uh, Alabama senator who mentioned that he met friends. And the first time he had been, what he would said, careless, outdoors, six feet away, 
and one of them was contagious and he literally this this gentleman died and his last posting was we messed up I, I let my guard down so again there's very good news about the vaccines but there's still lots of reasons to be careful and cautious about going forward so in terms of testing I, I no doubt everybody here has had some experience with testing for schools for work for their own illness or traveling and so on and the, the tests that you need to understand a little bit uh, pcr is the test where they that's the one where they put the swab up your nose. It takes maybe one, two, three days to get back. It's a very sensitive test. So it tells you if you have the illness. The trouble with this one is that, say for example, you got it on day one and you may be no longer uh, contagious by day 10 or day 14, you may still be positive up to weeks later. So if any of you have had experience with having these keep turn positive, um, it, it, it it's a marker that you have still illness or, or virus. It does not tell you whether you're necessarily contagious. These are the tests that you will be asked to get before you go back to school, before three days, before you travel internationally. And you'll need to submit and we'll come back to how you do that and where. But those are the tests that they could ask because it's very sensitive. The antigen test is the one that's very rapid. It's not as accurate. If it is positive, it means pretty accurately that you're contagious. That's very good news. It's what they're using for screening when you come back from certain countries and hotels and events and so on. The bad news is it's not entirely accurate. If you have symptoms, it'll catch about seven out of 10 people who have it, but three out of 10 people who are contagious will have, still have a negative test. And if there's no symptoms, it's actually six out of 10. So just something to be aware of because we've all heard cases, either the Rose Garden had the, the, they had the antigen tests and obviously a number of people who got through the screening were sick and then it turned into a super spreader event. Um, they just came out recently with the idea that people who are fully vaccinated um, do not need to get tested even if they're exposed, known exposure to COVID. Uh, however, if you're a public health employee working in a nursing home or so on, you do need to. This is still sort of a contentious idea is that if you've been fully vaccinated and somehow exposed or have the illness with no symptoms, could you spread the illness? And that's a number of people sent a, a email questions about that. And it's not entirely clear. The thinking, the consensus of the various resources I've looked at is that if you have no symptoms and you've been vaccinated, you could still have the virus, you could still spread it, but it's less likely. If you have symptoms, it's much more likely that you have a high viral load or more virus in you and more likely that you can spread this. And the antibody tests some of us may have had to see if we either had proof that we were sick in the past so that we need that we know whether or not we need to get vaccinated or not. Um, it is decent in terms of determining in some period of time whether you had COVID, if you're within say six weeks of when you were sick. One thing it, doesn't really tell you is um, antibodies translate to having antibodies, it doesn't translate to immunity. So just because you have the antibodies doesn't mean that you're protected. And while I'm on that, I'll also mention the issue that just because you had COVID and you have some degrees of antibodies doesn't mean that you're prevented from getting disease. So even if you have COVID, it's always recommended you get at least one and probably both vaccines of the RNA if you can. So this is sort of, this was an LA uh, nightclub that was offering in the cover of charge that they would get a 10 minute COVID antigen test. And again, just to reiterate, if you're vaccinated and you're going to this as a young, healthy person, that's fine. But if you're a little bit older or have comorbidities and so on, a lot of the people, about 60% of the people who might be contagious, it will catch, but 30% it will not. So it is not an effective screening for keeping you from safe. It's an effective screening for a large population so we can track who does or doesn't have the illness, for example, in schools and universities and so on. Um, a couple of things that our clients carry, and I would suggest if, if, that if you don't have one, it's a decent household test to have now, is that little O2 sat monitor. It's about $40, $40, $50. You just keep it charged with a little USB mini cord and you put that over your finger, it'll tell you what your heart rate is and tell you how much oxygen. And I've used this with clients all over the world. It's a very useful bit of information. And particularly for if you're discussing, if you know you have COVID and you're trying to figure out how sick you are, the two things that have recently come out that if your saturation drops below 92%, you should be around 95. 
or if your heart, your respiratory rate, the number of times you breathe per minute gets up above 23, those are both indicators that something serious is happening. It's time to get to the ER. Most of you are probably breathing around 12 to 16 times. So it's actually a big change. If you were speaking to someone on the phone and they were breathing at 23 times a minute, you would notice it. You would say, wow, they're, they're, something's wrong. So it's not subtle. These are, these are important findings that, that there's effects on the lungs or the heart and it's time to get to the ER. And I mentioned the no exercise rule for some of those um, who've either had it or may still contract COVID, even if it's relatively asymptomatic. It does have effects on the hearts and the lungs. And while most of us have grown up in the era where viruses were things you might exercise through the recovery, it's, it's important that you don't over-exercise during a COVID recovery because it does affect the heart. They, did, they took 100 college athletes who had uh, COVID and they found with an MRI analysis of the heart that 78 of them had demonstrated effects, decreased the ability of the heart to pump. The good news is most of them recovered, but it's thought that while they're recovering is not a time for them to overly exert themselves. And one of the comparisons that one of the um, exercise physiologists made was it's like taking a division one athlete and turning them into a division three athlete. It can have a very pronounced effect. And unfortunately there have been some very sad stories of professional athletes who've had either really serious events or have had a really difficult recovery coming back from COVID. In terms of treatment, again, I mentioned this for those of you who may not have been vaccinated or if you have comorbidities or immunosuppressed that you still, that, that, that being sick with this is still a possibility or you have relatives overseas, the monoclonal antibodies are, are still a fabulous treatment. Um, but something I would mention, you can, actually, you can actually Google this for where it is in your area. There are treatment centers that will give you supplies. So you could Google, for example, San Diego and it will highlight the various treatment centers that are giving this out not giving this out, they're actually administering this to the appropriate patients. And I would tell you it's a fabulous treatment, but you, you need to go before you get really sick. So if you have a positive diagnosis, it's important that you speak to someone, either your primary care or an infectious disease doctor on whether you need to go see them or call one of these centers and ask them if you fit the criteria because it's very effective early on. It's not so effective later on. I'll mention Luvox and Ivermectin because some of us, I'm sure there are people on the phone who has relatives or employees in different parts of the world where different treatment modalities are not available. Luvoxamine is actually a, uh, a um, SSRI, so it's an antidepressant. It's called a serotonin uptake inhibitor. And it actually has a remarkable benefit if you have an early diagnosis of COVID, it has a very good effect of keeping many of the people who take it out of the hospital from severe COVID. And ivermectin is similar, it's an antiparasite drug. And I mention it because people who have either relative, say for example, in India or South America where the disease is, is really ravaging, um, these are things that they can get access to that can help them because the hospitals are, are really overrun. So if you're vaccinated, they just came out with a report yesterday about the breakthrough the problems with people who've been vaccinated, both sequence for two weeks, at least two weeks after the second in the series, and they've been diagnosed with COVID. So the good news is it's about somewhere around 100 million, maybe 90 million to 100 million who've been vaccinated, and they've documented 10,000 breakthrough cases, which means that they're COVID positive, they're vaccinated, and somewhere about a third of them have no symptoms at all. But of those, of those 10,000, about 1,000 people ended up being hospitalized and 2% of those people did die. So it is still a serious illness to be taken seriously. There is great news about vaccine. It's a great comfort, but it's not a get out of jail free card. But so as you probably know, Pfizer and Moderna are both getting approval for the 11 to 17 year old age group. So they hope that the teenagers will be able to now get vaccinated and be uh, less concerned. There's a lot of people that have sort of speculated that young kids and teenagers aren't as susceptible, they don't get sick from this. And while there is some truth to that, there are unfortunately a number of rather serious complications for uh, children and teenagers who get this. And so um, it is something to still take very seriously. Um, a second vaccine or vaccine of either one of the RNAs have been shown to improve long COVID symptoms. So if you know someone who's struggling with it and they may not think that it's important that they get vaccinated, it actually does improve. And let's see. 
You may have read recently about, this is another breakthrough case where nine of the Yankees turned positive and they'd all been vaccinated. They'd all been together. They get regular antigen testing. But what happened is that it looks like one, they got the Johnson Johnson, which is not quite as effective. But fortunately, it seems that there were a breakthrough case that they all got positive, but there were no real symptoms. So it looks like that may be a relatively safe place for us to be is if you're vaccinated, you turn positive doesn't seem too serious for the majority of us. In terms of the Olympics, if some of you are either going as athletes, relatives, families, coaches, or so on, there have been a lot of discussions about the safety of going to Japan. Japan is struggling with a, a rather serious uh, uptick in terms of cases and mortality. And unfortunately, they've only vaccinated about 4% of the population. So I find that a little bit surprising given that it's a relatively tightly controlled society, but that's the case where they are now. I'm hoping that, that they will surround the Olympic Village and, and travelers or visitors with people who've been vaccinated if they can. But if it is something you're considering, um, feel free to reach out to me um, in between the, or after the uh, presentation and we can discuss some of the risks or some of the ways you might be able to, to improve your um, chances. So a couple of questions that we get all the time is if you get, if you get COVID versus getting um, the vaccination, which is better? And it turns out that the vaccination is better that of improving your chance, your um, immune protection than the illness. And it's even better that if you had COVID, if you go ahead and get at least one and probably both of the vaccines. And as I mentioned earlier that a vaccinated person, it looks like they can get positive, they can get COVID, and it looks like they may be able to transmit it to someone else, but that's one of the things we're trying to figure out the most right now. As to, as to how long you're protected, it's really not known. There are all sorts of speculations between six months to nine months to maybe a year, and that's one of the challenges that we come into with people who are not going to get vaccinated. Are we going to have these pockets of outbreaks that are going to come where there's going to be a big peak in number of cases and it's going to occur maybe in six or nine months and now those who thought they're protected because of vaccination are no longer. Uh, a recent study of, uh, from the England in England of the public health system there found that there's some really pretty encouraging news that a number of the variants are protected, we're protected from those variants with the vaccinations. So immunocompromised, there are a few people that ask various questions about the different uh, illnesses that they may have or relatives. And I just mentioned some of the reasons why someone may be immunocompromised, steroids, cancers, and so on, things that you may know of. Smoking is a reason that you may be immunosuppressed. And it means that for those people who can get the vaccine, they're not nearly as successful in terms of a immunologic response particularly the first dose is not that helpful. And the second one is really important, but whereas someone who doesn't have this kind of illness may be sent where around 60 or 80% with the first vaccine and up to 90 after the second, someone who's immunocompromised may be closer to 10 or 15% on the first one and maybe 50% on the second. And there's a, this is one of the reasons why it's, it's kind of careful. We're, we're trying to be careful about continuing to wear masks and so on being aware of the other people in and around you, your household, your relatives, and so on. So in terms of traveling, some of the things that, to keep in mind uh, is that there's gonna be a need for some sort of verification that you've either been vaccinated or you've had a negative test. And there's lots of different people who are get, putting a, their stake in this. The Department of Homeland Security, the World Health Organization, it's not gonna be a global or a national effort. So what you'll find is if you're thinking of traveling, it's going to be either the, it's going to be a combination of it's going to be the airline, it's going to be the hotel, it may be the resort, it may be the travel agency. They're all going to have different criteria for when and what kind of proof they, they require. And some of them are digital passports. So for example, the Excelsior Pass is developed by IBM and New York State is starting to use this so you can get into public events. The International Air Air Transportation Association represents about 300 uh, airlines worldwide, and they have a digital health pass passport. So there are different ones, Verify is one. Even dating apps are starting to have ways to verify your COVID vaccination status for dating. And I, I well, probably about a month ago, I was down in the Bahamas, and you'll find that it's kind of a mishmash. So everybody has a different claim, 
And I would tell you that when you travel, you want to bring up some type of back, um, backup. So bring literally a photocopy of your vaccination, bring a digital passport, and that applies even to your passport. Bring a, keep a copy with you because everybody seems to have a different thing that they require and you don't want to be stuck because your app doesn't open up or it fails somehow or it doesn't upload your images and so on. So the other um, caution I'll give you for those of you who are traveling is that these tests, they're going to require either you, you're going to get, need a PCR before you go. They'll probably require some antigen tests a couple of days after you get there. And depending how long you are, there, they may do them every five days. And they may require, the US government may require an antigen test for you to come back. And all of these tests, um, if you're in certain countries, they know they have you. They can be $150 a test. Some of them are very nice, they're very accurate, they come to your hotel and so on, but, but it's, a, it's an expensive venture to keep in mind if you're thinking of traveling, for example, with a large family or kids. So like I said before, we're not quite out of jail yet, and particularly if we're not vaccinated, there's still lots of reasons to be careful. Just a couple of things about where you travel and how you do. If you're gonna be traveling in a, in a taxi, for example, so you don't know the immune status or the vaccination status to the driver, I would suggest that you wear a mask, whether you wanna wear um, eye protection is up to you. But even if you're vaccinated, the best way to keep a, a barrier between you is to actually open up the windows opposite. So the passenger window in front of you and then the passenger window across the seat from you. So it creates a sort of wind barrier between you is the best way to travel. In terms of traveling by plane, I actually consider that the plane itself is not the risky area. And for people who have a number of questions of where they're going and what countries and hotels, the risk when you're in a plane is probably the lowest of the trip. The risk when you're in the airport, the risk when you're in public transportation, the risk when you're trying to get something to eat are probably the high risk areas. So this is a flight that went to, to Ireland early in 2020. All those blue seats are empty. So those positive cases, half that plane came positive just from one person. And this is some of the people were wearing masks and some of them were not wearing masks and so on. The good news is that there is HEPA filters, there are high efficiency filters, there's a rapid turnover of air, depends on the airline for how much it is, but it's very effective. So the rates before vaccination with masks, when you had a middle seat that was empty, it's about one in 8,000 that you would get COVID even following good protocols. And if the middle seats are full, it's about half that. The good news is that because so many people are getting vaccinated, those, rate, those numbers will improve dramatically until we, if they do take off the mask mandate, then it's gonna go the other way. It's gonna be much more serious because now there'll be so much more free flowing air that's not filtered. So some advice that I tend to tell people, I mean, I think most people are very careful about being clean around the public restrooms and so on. And that's still the case. It's still the case, even though there's not a high transmission from contact services, it's still important to clean and wipe down the trays and the buttons and things, even the air vent that you might not think of and keep wipes for your hand and hand sanitizers and so on. A couple other things, I, I mean, the food isn't very good anymore anyway, but I would recommend you do not eat during the, the when they bring the food, eat in between because that's when everybody has their masks off. You wanna eat when everybody put their masks back on. Um, Put the vent right over your head and leave it on full. If you have to bring extra clothing because it gets chilly, that's fine. But these are some of the ways to help improve. And, and again, this is not the risky area. So when you're thinking about the various countries and so on, it's more of where you're going and how and what kind of location you're going to be. So again, this is the, the Bahamas is one of the places we went. So your resources, when you want to figure out what, what's required, the U.S. Embassy for that country will have resources very specific for what the country needs. The other one that I'm a big fan of is the uh, International Air Transportation Association. So you can click on the country you're going to and you can register your name and your email and it'll tell you everything that's required and it'll also send you updates up into the trip that you're going to. So it's a very useful website. Um, evacuation insurance, I, I won't go into too depth, but I would tell, um, I can't tell you the number of events where I've been asked to try and help evacuate somebody from acro across the globe um, who just didn't think something medical or traumatic would happen. And unfortunately they just do. And now they're in a foreign country. They need better, better definitive care. There are a number of great policies and carriers out there before COVID. I mean, Travel Guard, International SOS, they're all great carriers, Red Point and so on. 
And again, I'm happy to speak to anybody on here who's trying to figure out which carriers they want to use and why. So my contact information will be later on in the presentation. But COVID threw a wrench in that because in the beginning part, when people were so sick, the, the evacuation policies didn't apply to COVID because one of the exclusion criteria for your policy is if you put the crew at risk, they can't fly you. So a number of this is one of the companies that came out and said, we will fly you if you're COVID positive because the issue you have to think about when you're traveling internationally is one, not only could you get sick with COVID, but two, what if they don't let you back in a country and you have to go through their healthcare system? And that is a real challenge to some of the countries that we're going to. So COVAC Globit is one of the ones that does, and you can also get, I think this is one of the few ones you can get a policy after you leave. But again, I'm happy to discuss those kind of details with people trying to make decisions about it. Um, and this is an example, again, when I looked after uh, three families that rented a very nice yacht to go through Croatia last year during the, the pandemic. So there are ways to travel safely, even if you're not vaccinated, but you have to be very careful about the environment we control. So in this case, it was a, a large private yacht and we've done all the screening, we've done all the COVID testing, we knew where all the COVID testing sites were gonna be all the way up and down the coast of Croatia, we knew where the medical facilities were and so on. So this is some of the things that you need to sort of think about when you're over there. And then I'm gonna share, this is the other things that happen that just happen when you travel. So I'm gonna throw this out as a video and this is one of our clients in there. And I'll, I'll, I'll warn you, the, the boy who gets injured in this video is perfectly fine. But this just does raise the kind of harrowing experiences that you can have when you travel. So that's him in the yellow shirt. And he takes a quick turnaround and falls between the boat. Again, he's fine. But he hit his head. So again, he's fine, but he did get knocked out. He was down in the water and we now have to figure out a way and where to go and take him in a, in a foreign country where you don't speak the language in the middle of a COVID pandemic. And for those of, the, those of you who are, speak, who are considering traveling, these are some of the things I don't want to scare you, but at least need to be aware of. And that's where things like evacuation services and so on. In this case, we literally, I mean, I spoke to the treating team. I walked the family through the various medical evaluations and traumatic issues that, that they are because they went to a trauma center. They took a quick look and then they put them out in the courtyard. Healthcare is very different in different countries. So some of the things you need to, you want to think about when you travel. And that's it for now. So I'll open up to questions and stop the screen share. Thank you, Chris. That was very interesting. And uh, and as you as you know, we've had a series of conversations through this pandemic. We had a, a couple conversations with Dr. Erica Sapphire of the La Jolla Institute of Immunology, which we were kind of into it. So it's now really great to get your perspective where we are today. And definitely, as we talk to our clients, there's there's an interest and there's a hope that we're getting to the close of the end of this tunnel. You know, we still have some some way to go, and you made that clear. We want to make sure we're thinking through some of these travel dynamics. So questions have come in. Could I pose a couple of these to uh, you here? Okay, great. Uh, some, we've got two that are kind of geographically specific. So regarding the India variant, mm -hmm. and there's a 30 to 50% higher mortality rate affecting the young. Mm -hmm. Can you share some thoughts on how is the changing the perspective of children being impacted by COVID? So I, I think it's the, the children issue is, I think it's, it sort of reinforces the idea that we shouldn't ignore children because they're young, because they get coronaviruses normally as kids and because they're young and healthy and the complications are so rare. I think it's changing the focus that we need to address them. We need to do the study. The studies are actually already well underway. They've proven very effective. In fact, it's more effective uh, for teenagers than it is for adults. And the studies now are going on for, I believe it's six months to 11 years old. So I think what it's reinforced the idea is that we have something to help prevent some of the very serious complications. They are rare. It's nowhere near the same impact it is for adults, but it is a reminder that we should not ignore this age group. Even though I have teenagers, even though they want, may want to ignore it, uh, medically speaking, there are ways to be careful about it and, and conversations to have with them about the risks. 
That makes sense. That makes sense. Very good. So we also have a couple uh, guests who are intending to travel to Africa. And so uh, later this summer and the fall, uh, which has also some dynamics going on in, in the country, can you share some of your thoughts on, on specifically what's going on in Africa and maybe thoughts that travelers heading that direction should be thinking about? Um, sure. So we have a number of clients who are traveling through Africa as well. And, and it, I think it's a matter of where are you going and how are you getting there? And I don't mean that you have to go incredibly high in travel, but it's more of a what kind of exposure are you going to be in? Are you going to be in small hotels? Are you planning to go into large public events? Are you going to be in, in the bazaars? Or are you going out on safari? And are you going to be in well-controlled, well-maintained, well-established travel organizations? There are a number, I, I would tell anybody who's going there are a number of evacuation policies that are very good. And I, it's not to say that it's going to be something awful, but you want to have the idea that if something happens, somebody has has a reason to come look for you or come get you out of there. Um, Redpoint is one of the ones I use a lot of, Travel Guard, like I said. It means that, that you, know, you can be in safe places where they do look into the, the, um, how clean the airs are, how well they're tested in terms of it. If you're gonna get into public markets, if you're gonna get into places like the Congo and so on that are a little riskier, that, that I would say would not be as a good idea maybe this summer, obviously for a, a variety of reasons, not, not mention that there's probably more coronavirus if they're not testing as, as thoroughly as they could or should, but there's obviously other, other issues like the volcano and so on. So there's risk in every way you go, but you can walk through the various steps you go and consider the risks and the exposures. So what kind of hotels, what kind of staff, and this is something there's been very good safari organizations that can walk you through what they do, where, and why. You know, do they, do they include things like flying doctors and so on? So there are ways to do it, but it, there are risks. And as I mentioned to you before we started our session earlier, is that one of the articles in the New York Times was speaking to epidemiologists and they interviewed a number of epidemiologists with various questions that people have already asked here. What about going to this country, about this country? And the, the range of what people do who are infectious disease and epidemiologists, that's all they study, was unbelievable from some people said, well, of course we go. And other people said, no way, we're not taking our kids. We're not going this. So these are general advice and it is a matter of comfort. So um, that's that would be my sort of see, is look at every step and who's going, I, I didn't mention that, but who in your team is at risk? Is anybody immunocompromised? Has everybody been vaccinated? I quite frankly would not take unvaccinated. I wouldn't go unvaccinated Really, I'm not sure I'd go anywhere I'm vaccinated right now because I made the Caribbean. But even then, um, you can really get into issues. Not only can you get sick, but you get really sick and then you can't get back. So that's my bottom line is, is at the very least get vaccinated. And if you're thinking of taking small kids, then you need to be in a very controlled um, bubble of your own. So, so there's not an exposure for them. Very good, thank you. Okay, we have also a couple of guests who, uh, who are connected to schools, thinking about school. And so uh, a question that I think might address a, um, a few in this group. So this particular school, they're testing every two weeks. Is that good enough to catch someone who has the virus? Maybe you can walk through some of that, that positive results window a little bit more. Well, so it, it, there's two questions there in that question. There's the individual, you as a family and you as your child is one issue. And then there's the bigger issue of the school. And so speaking for you as an individual, you start with, do we have good masks? Are my children wearing them kind of deal? And, and that's probably the most important hand washing and so on, because there are a number of studies about even not very good masks in people who were contagious with COVID before vaccine, the masks are really very effective. And schools, we've been very surprised in the last year I personally am one of those people, I thought there would be a, a, a terrible outbreak of children from going back to school. The other risk in that is that the exposure to the adults, uh, the teachers and so on, and that, that is still a problem. But you as sending your kids back to, if they're, they're careful about the mask and they're careful about their social circles, for example, a number of the outbreaks in universities and prep schools and so on, didn't come from going to class. It came from the COVID parties. It came from taking your mask off on the weekends. It came from 
breaking out of your circle, which is understandable. These are kids, there's a really challenging time for them. In terms of getting back to the school and screening, I mean, they can't, they can't unfortunately, if the COVID testing, if the antigen testing were really rapid and really inexpensive, they could literally do it every day you go back to school, but it would, the cost would be extraordinary. Some of the schools are actually now testing the sewage because you can check a, the sewage from one dorm and screen the entire sewage to find any evidence of COVID vaccine. And then you go through and check out the individuals. So there are ways of doing larger screening and then fine tuning it down to where it may come. We know that there is a tremendous mental health burden for kids who do not socially interact, also for adults, but also for kids. So while honestly, I have two college kids and both of them said, we're not going back. This remote learning is terrible. It was, a, it was a waste. They're going back in the fall. And I think now with the combination of vaccines and so on, I think it's appropriate. If you have children who are younger than say 18 and aren't eligible yet, it looks like maybe October, they may be getting it, but maybe as early as September. I think there's ways of safely doing it and balancing the idea that they need to get among their friends. Mm -hmm. We are all having discussions about the safety of our kids and what they do, what they do with their friends when they take their masks off. What happens when teenagers drink? I mean, it's just, you know, it's things we've all dealt with, but now they have to think of things like COVID. So it's a complicated discussion. It is. We're definitely entering a new chapter and, and there's, a, there's an impetus for kids to get back in school and what, what will that look like and what does that mean? And I'll, I'll remind you, Anna, I, I've sent my contact out for the people who are asking these individual questions. If you want to chat about it in greater detail, I'm happy to set up a call because these are tough choices. So thank you. Thank you for that, Kristen. Yes, to remind us, a couple of guests who sent questions, we will also again post his contact information at the end of the session. So you'll see that one more time. Uh, so let me ask another question here, uh, Chris. So there are some commentary about the impact on the lungs for a COVID patient. So someone had read a news article, and I think a couple of people did, of the x-ray image of a lung of a COVID patient and that the scars look worse than a lifelong smoker. Do you believe with mild to no symptoms, uh, COVID patients have lung damages like those who had severe symptoms? Well, I think, um, so yes, there are clearly rather pronounced effects in relative, relatively asymptomatic patients. We know that. I think that the, the severity of the effects is somewhat um, comparable to the severity of the symptoms. So if you were somebody who were, was on a ventilator, you were in an intensive care setting for weeks, we know there was a lot of damage, there was a lot of effects in your lungs. But we also know that there, there was really some rather um, um, surprising effects for people who had very few symptoms. And I will tell you from the ER, when I was mentioning the saturation, that we used to have people that if they came in with a saturation in the 80s. That was an indication in many ways, to either get extra oxygen, even consider a ventilator, I mean, very, very serious interventions. Yeah. Now there are people who would come in the door with 40 or 50% readings we've honestly never seen. It's a very strange effect. We learn things like you have to turn a patient over and put them on their stomach. I mean, it's, an, it's just such an unusual illness and so on. So to answer your question, we know that there are effects in the lungs. I was just actually listening to a lecture about things like uh, nitrous oxide and various other um, naturopathic solutions and things that may be considered for scarring in long-term. But the answer is yes, there can be very pronounced scarring. Could it be worse than smoking? I haven't seen that comparison made. Um, the, the, it, it would depend on the degree of smoking and, the, and the, um, how long you smoke and so on. But, they're, they're different. So one is a, an inflammation and one is a chemical inflammation. So I haven't seen it, but I'm, I'm sure that there are unfortunately similarities in how severe and how, how much affected, how affected you may be. Okay, thank you, thank you. Okay, so we have uh, a couple of travelers who are hoping to cruise in the next coming months uh, or year. How do you feel about cruises uh, in that particular travel? Well, I'm not, I'm not a big fan of the cruise ship medical support. Um, I, I, you know, I've had my, it, um, I wouldn't say run-ins, but I've certainly had patients that we've dealt with in cruise ships. I've had patients who have been sick and literally dropped off in the port 
in Greece said, you're too sick for us. You're in a hospital, see you later. Um, I think it's a large volume business. And so in the short term, um, while we're figuring out, you know, are they ever going to be able to say, well, we want everybody vaccinated? I don't think so. I think they'll probably be one of the industries that say, we'll take your word for it. I don't want to be on that ship with, I you know, guarantee people will get through the screening or no screening who will have the illness and there will be outbreaks. I guarantee it. It's going to happen. Um, what I would say is if, if you're a big fan of it, and there are some unbelievable crews available, is that could you find a way to find the smaller ships, the you know 40 guests, 50 guests, where they have better control of the staff, they have better control of, of the travelers. If you're if you're a diehard traveler, the other one is is you know give it a couple months. If they start opening, I believe it's, it's the fall that they're planning on getting ships out back and see. I I wouldn't I wouldn't be in the first wave of travelers for a couple months, and and I hate to say it, but we will see what the numbers, we'll see what cases. We'll see what happens. There are too many areas in the world that are raging COVID locations like South America, like India and so on, that with international travel being so easy, it's hard to imagine that there will not be people who get through the screening and be on that ship. And then like we did in the fall, what happens if you're on it? How do you get off? Because then the, the places where you're going to, remember what they did with the ship, they said, well, nobody can get off. I can't imagine a worse place to be than to be sick on a ship and then say, well, you know, the port doesn't want you or the Bahamas doesn't want you or whatever, you know, beautiful place you're visiting does not want sick patients. That's my caution. Okay, thank you. So a couple more questions around the India variant, because that's one that's that's front and center right now. If, if it does become more dominant globally, will it be safe to travel even with back, the, the current vaccines? What are your thoughts there? Well, that's a great question. And that's, that's probably the, the most recent headlines is around those very various issues. We already know, whereas for example, in England, the B117 was the, was the new kid in, in, in the block mm -hmm. because I don't know, three, maybe six months ago where it started to show up in England and, and it was again, oh my gosh, it's more transmissible, it's more sick and so on. That was a big concern. And now it looks like in the last week or two, the Indian variant the India variant is actually doing the same thing to be 117 did. It's now in 40% of the new cases in England. The good news is so far is that the initial studies, and they just came out, England um, Department of Health or, or Ministry of Health came out and said it looks like the vaccinations are protective against almost all the variants. Um, so the, the, the one thing we know that the variants are bad at is when I mentioned the monoclonal antibodies, the Regeneron, so we know that those are not as effective against the variants. But it looks like the variants, the vaccines so far are protective. And I will also add to that, that they're already, Moderna I know is already working on a, a booster shot specific to the variants. I think Pfizer may be doing the same or they're considering a third shot to boost your immunity. So a year ago, I would never have imagined we would have this many vaccine options that would be this effective. So this really amazingly good news. The bad news is we, we're having trouble getting it to all those who need it. So but it's a very good question. Yeah, I think it's a, a, a lot of people's minds to see if that, that broadens. Okay, so uh, a couple who wanted a little more elaboration, if you could, uh, Chris, on the 50, 30, 20 rule you referenced. And you mentioned you have to be very careful <laughs> in exercising. <laughs> they said, Sorry. A of saying, can you explain that? Yeah, a I went a little bit. More familiar with it. So maybe right, 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 on that. <laughs> All right, when you talk to yourself, you know, your time is going to be <laughs> So what, what that recommendation is, is the first week you go to 50% capacity. So if you're, you know, whatever kind of distance or speed or so, and you go to 50% of that for a week. And the symptoms you're looking for, are you having chest pain? Are you lightheaded? Are you short of breath? If you don't, you go up 30% the next week. And then you go up the final 20% the third week. So over the course of three weeks somewhere, what you wanna do is a progression. You don't wanna start out, I'm, I'm sick. I, whenever I get a cold, I just run my marathon. I run my six miles, whatever. And I work myself through it or I sit in a sauna. And that's actually, there's truth to that for general viruses. You raise your body temperature, it helps eliminate the viruses. That's not the case here because we're worried about whether you have asymptomatic effects on your lungs or your heart you may not know about. And that's where your symptoms of shortness of breath may come in. So sorry about rushing through that one. No, thank you. Thanks for elaborating on that. 
Okay, so we have uh, so many really appreciated the insight on traveling on an airplane and people have already been traveling or they're wanting to do longer travel on airplanes. And some of the data you shared showed some interesting points about not having people in the middle seats and you know the benefit of all that. The planes are full. I mean, I think many are saying planes are they full. Are. So with Delta that- is, but That's about it. Yeah. <laughs> I think Delta stopped too. Exactly, so clearly the airlines aren't, aren't, uh, aren't uh, buying into that, that benefit. But if seats are full, individuals are asking, is it better to sit on a window seat or an aisle? Is there a preference? A recommendation you have there if it is a pretty full flight <laughs> so i hate to say this but if if you have the option you'd be surprised i would if you're i don't think it's going to make a difference for a seat or an aisle um i mean i guess the aisle is maybe more air but then you're also exposed to the people walking up and down i haven't seen anything documenting it what i would say is if you're going to do something if if and I don't know, the airlines are crazy these days. You can't get a basic seat anymore without paying 30 to $50 for every flight because you want to put your legs two inches further. If you add all that up, if you're, if you're going to go and you have the means, is think about first class because there the spacing is better. And, and some of them have some very nice deals up until the flight leaves that, now this is changing because obviously tickets are going up in every is, but that's, that's one of it. I have not seen anything to suggest one seat versus the other. I would tell you that if you're vaccinated and you're wearing an N95 mask, and again, I'm happy to help people figure out where, but mm -hmm. I, I think you're okay to go. Uh, um, if you're not vaccinated, I, I mean, I traveled a couple times without it, and but the, the spacing was much better than it is now. So there's a little bit of risk there. I, again, if you go through an airport, that's where you wonder. You see the people sitting in the, in the waiting room, they've got their mask over the top of the head or they've got it, sort of their noses out. Those are the areas where I think are much higher risk than the actual plane. And the, the big one is where do you eat? Where do you take your mask off is the big issue. And, and for some, I didn't take a mask off first time, a couple times I flew. Okay. Okay, great. So if you were to you know, create a list, a short list, based on what we know today, Chris, of the, the no-go travel places, these are places that you would just say, gosh, I really would not go there at this moment in time. Maybe you'd put India on that list, maybe right now. What other places would you put on the very high concern locations? I, I still think England is, is a bit of an unknown. I think Europe's a bit of unknown. They have a couple of countries that are really struggling and, and I, I, I can't keep coming back to this, but the issue is how, how well can you control your your entry and exit from where you're going and where you're going to be. So if you're on a private yacht off the coast, you're in good shape. If you're in a public hotel and you have to go through the public hospitals, if you get sick, if you're, you know, in London, then I'm, I'm not as comfortable. Yet. I know they're headed in a better direction, but there are some really serious outbreaks. I would put India on there. I would put, I don't know if you've heard, but the Seychelles has had, having not a large number, but percent wise is having a terrible outbreak the countries have re have either needed to or been rewarded with immunizations from different countries. And I know the Seychelles, for example, I think they got their vaccination. Uh, I won't say which country because I can't remember. I, I thought it was Ch uh, uh, China, Chinese version of immunization. And for some reason, they have not, um, it wasn't very effective and they have a very high number of recurrent ca cases, even despite a very high vaccination rate. Uh, South America, Brazil, I would not go to. Um, there, are, there are places, um, in uh, I think Manus is the country or the county where so many people had the illness originally that they thought they were actually through the through the pandemic. There were not very many vaccinations, but because the variants had come through in a second wave, many of the people got sick and they're completely overwhelmed. There are parts of South America that are probably fine, but I would stay away from Brazil. And and uh, you know I, I think again there are certain sites you can go into and look at where the numbers are going. Japan has a very, very low vaccination rate. I, I, right. I would not put Japan high on that list. Um, you know, New Zealand, if you can get in, is probably very good. Australia is better. Um, and even some of the um, this, uh, Southeast Asia and so on, what happens if you get sick? What happens if you turn positive? Where are you? And that's already an issue, medically speaking, anyway. If you get sick or injured in these countries, it's an issue I have for many of our clients is, you turn into a patient, you're just another patient and, and there are different priorities. I don't care where you flew into, they don't care where you are because they can't, they have to take care of everything in front of them, so. Absolutely. Uh, Mexico, by the way, I'm gonna throw Mexico out 
only for, for a couple of different reasons. Like I said, I do work a lot with uh, former Secret Service, FBI teams, uh, British SAS teams. Mexico is always a quandary. And one of the reasons is you have to consider security risks where you go. And Mexico is probably the highest in terms of your personal risk. And the security, security teams that I work with do not or will not go to Mexico, mostly because they cannot, one, they can't carry a weapon usually, and they don't trust the local police. And I know a lot of people to go. I have relatives to go. It is not that reliable. And there are a lot of very random sort of uh, ATM uh, holdups where they, at some point, they take and say, take 3,000 out of your, uh, your ATM. There are ways you should figure out who is, who is screening the driver to your resorts and even being at high end resorts. Mexico is a bit of a wild card for me as well. Thank you. Okay, that's helpful insight for our guests. Well, well, Chris, thank you for, for giving us the time on Q&A. There was a, a fair amount of questions came in, so it's great to go through those. To our guests, I know we're a little bit over on time, but we hope that that additional um, space to go through your additional questions was helpful. If there are additional questions that we did not get to, please feel free to reach out to your DNY team. We will do our best to answer them. And then as Chris mentioned, he's very willing to answer them. And so you'll see in just a minute or two here, the contact information for Dr. Sidford. And, uh, and again, he was kindly willing to, to respond to, to many of those questions. Thank you to all of you for joining us. We hope this was productive use of your time. We know there's some interest in traveling. We all wanna make sure one does it safely and, um, and as informed as possible. On behalf of our team, we appreciate it and we'll hope to see you in our next conversation. Thanks, Dr. Sidford. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you, Anne. Wonderful job, thank you.